I'm delighted to be here to talk about my favourite topic, and the, the talk we had from Frank Mills was fascinating. The first uh, time I really began to appreciate the importance of air and what it moves around in a building was when I started in microbiology in the old Victoria, and we used to do the autoclaving in the basement. And there was another department in another building who would send somebody along to complain about the smell. And my boss was adamant there was no way they could smell it. If you've ever smelled an autoclave and the stuff coming out, it does honk. Um, until they made us go up on the roof and investigate, and it turned out, right enough, the exhaust from our lab was right next to the intake from their building. And so this interest was born. Over the years, I have invested in a whole lot of kit, you know, a CO2 monitor, PM monitor, um, an anometer measuring the speed of air, but actually the best kit, and this parks back, this is actually recycled, but good old toilet paper for indicating, well, I can't blow through this, that's excellent, it's working, is which way the air is blowing. So watch out for an example of that. We know air is powerful. On the macro level, we can see that it can pick up, shift masses of, of materials like particles of Sahara sand dust and dump it many, many miles away. But even within a building space, what happens within, an air, within the air? The problem in a hospital is you can't see the pathogens and you can't see the air. And you can't always feel it because it's not moving like wind unless you've got some really high air exchanges. So when we, the airborne pandemic hit us in Scotland, there was a rush to the, to the hospitals, uh, to, the, to the shops to look for toilet paper. I thought it was the ICDs, infection control doctor teams, going out to get their kit to go around the hospital to work out what on earth was going on with the air. Because suddenly, air mattered again. We now have tools to help us to see what's happening with the air. You've seen examples of the computer um, models of fluid dynamics of what's happening with air. Not everybody can see that. But we also now have tools to see what bugs are in the air. We used to rely on uh, agar and culturable methods, which are great. But we've always known air is not sterile. Water is not sterile. Our hospitals are not sterile. The point of infection control is not to achieve sterility. It's to achieve a level of pathogens, potential pathogens, that are low enough not to pose a high probability of getting an infection for the people in your space. This is a fascinating project in Michigan, which a brand new hospital, they've measured the microbiome um, from opening and how it's changed. So even if you walk into a room, your personal flora will enter into the microbiome of that room and alter it. The thing about air is that it has an interface with all the other parts. So you turn on a water tap, you get some splashes, a bit of aerosolization, that's now in the air. What the air does with that, where it goes, where it dumps it, how it removes it, that's where ventilation comes in. Um, and, and also, it interacts with us. We live on air. We live on the oxygen in the air. So we are continuously breathing in and out. There's an interface with all the mucosa as it goes in right down into the alveoli. So it's actually a really cunningly excellent way of a pathogen to get into your system. But obviously, if you've got any wounds or anything else, it dumps it. Theatres are all about stopping the air moving and dumping pathogens onto the skin. So... This is just a quick um, um, slide of this study that's made a lot of uh, headlines from uh, Adenbrook, where they've looked at um, using HEPA filtration. And you can see that uh, it's, it's full. Basically, the air is full of all sorts of bugs, including fungi, E. coli, not your classic airborne pathogens, but they're there. Then put the HEPA on, and they disappear. Look out for a talk later on by Mark Butler, in which he's going to talk about we're progressing this study into a, a care of the elderly ward to see how much impact we can have. But the aim of the game is quite simple. Reduce the infectious dose. So for each pathogen, there will be a dose response curve, and that varies according to the pathogen and the type of person who is in the space. So if you've got no white cells, you don't need to meet a lot of a fungus. You can only meet one spore, and it can cause a horrendous pneumonitis and has a high uh, mortality rate. So the aim of the game is to know how much you have to reduce the number of pathogens in a space, and ha not just in a space, but over time. So if you're in a space for a long time, you need to be reducing it more. So it's all about context, 
how much effort, how much of the, the, the carbon footprint are we going to have to put in place in order to reduce the chances, the probability of getting an infection? And that is where in, in microbiologists, estates teams, infection control teams have to work together. I'm no engineer. Uh, I liked physics, but uh, I'm, I'm no chemist either. But I do understand pathogens, and I do understand the consequence of getting this wrong, the consequence of, bang, meeting that infectious dose and getting an infection. So there, this is just a schemata from the SHTM, which shows it's for theatres. There's an air handling unit, and the red marks I've put in are just to show these are points at which it can go horribly wrong with dire consequences. I like to talk about patient-centered ventilation. Why are we bothering our socks to put these big air handling units in to have, you know, if you printed out all the SHTMs, they're massive. Why do we bother? It's because of the patients and, of course, other people who are in the space, healthcare workers. But fundamentally, this is about patient-centered ventilation. We're going to skip through some of the examples of where it's gone wrong. So first of all, where's the air come from? Where's it come from? Where's it going? You know, it comes from Sahara, dump sand uh, in Austria. If your air is outside and you've got great big demolitions, a lot of hospitals have had works being put, uh, new buildings put up, a lot of demolition. And you can see if, you're, if the wind is blowing into your inlet over these moldy old bits of material, you're going to have millions, a really heavy, heavy dose of infectious um, aerosols, uh, aerosolized um, aspergillus, for example, and there are many outbreaks associated with taking in. So you've got to think about what you can do to the air if it's coming in. HEPA filtration um, in bone marrow transplant units are exactly for that reason, to stop the outside contamination accessing the patient for whom it's going to be dangerous. This, I'm trying to get this, this is um, an outside area where there's lots of pigeon guano, and then there's a fan, and this fan is designed to cool off a big piece of machinery. When it's switched on, of course, hot air rises, and the fan pushes it up. Maybe no big deal, unless straight above it, as there happens to be, is an inlet. So you've got all sorts of pathogen potential going up. So thinking about what's happening with the supply, an open window, great. We're tell going around telling everybody, open your windows, open your windows, get some natural ventilation going in. Except if this is a staff room in a theatre suite, and that, you can see there's lots of, of bird poo there as well. The air's coming in, the wind's blowing this direction, the doors to the staff room are open. Just around the corner is an operating theatre with its doors open. So you've got this fantastic machinery in the roof controlling all the air coming in, and then you just open and there's a whole row of these windows. What has that done to the cascade? You've got to find out where the air is going, what it's doing. <laughs> this is to remind me of an ITU, which I worked in once, which we had a whole lot of work going on just outside the window, and it was roasting hot summer. There was people digging up earth, so you've got potential for Legionella, Bacillus, um, fungal spores, and the staff kept opening the window because the patients are hot. It's very, very uncomfortable. And we kept having this debate, and I know that the last year for a lot of IPC teams has been difficult for the open the windows, shut the windows. What's the balance of risk here? And it wasn't until, and this isn't actually a picture of it, but a ferret tried to come into the window of the ITU right next to the head of a patient. Everybody shut the windows after that. <laughs> that was it. They didn't give me the photo, unfortunately, of the real ferret, but I found this photo online. So if a ferret can get in, a microscopic spore of a fungus can get in too. So whilst, yes, opening the windows, natural air is very good, the reason most clinical spaces, as Frank said, is mechanical ventilation, is it's controllable. You can have standards around it. You know what's happening. You can, you can have provenance of the air coming in. You can have control mechanisms for it. Does this matter? I mean, for the last 20 years, you start talking about ventilation. Oh, gosh. But the last six months, of that has changed. I'm here talking about ventilation. This is amazing. People are waking up to ventilation being important. It's mattered forever. This is not a new concept. We've got, and please do look up. You can get my slides afterwards. Look up all these um, references because they do meticulous research on what has gone wrong. You have eight cases of pulmonary aspergillosis. And it's because the windows are open, there's poor ceiling, low speed fans. There's an MRSA outbreak in an ITU. Turns out it was always in the same bed and they worked out that the exhaust from another ward was coming straight through the window 
onto that bed. Uh, NIC infections with inadequate, just no clean air coming in from anywhere. Bacillus. And what you'll get is months and months, possibly years of nothing, no problems. And then suddenly, all the holes in the cheeses align, and boom. And that is the story of infection control. So, um, unfortunately, uh, you know, if your dog has been near a muddy water, uh, you can tell that they've, they've, they've been there. With air, it's not so easy. Once again, it's invisible. How can you tell what the tools that we have? Well, unfortunately, well, we, we can use agar plates. They will only grow things that can grow. And this is an example of um, a problem we picked up in the hospital, a new hospital, by using agar plates. And we found fungus, an increase in fungal counts, and had to go looking. It's better to find out this way than finding out from your patients. You don't want to be using your patients as agar plates. But often that's the case. You get an increase in Lyme infections. You get an increase in aspergillosis. You get increase in wound infections. Somebody somewhere spots it. And again, if you look through some of these references I have, it takes us somebody astute to say, hang on a minute, for seven years we've not had any cases. And now we've had six. It's not a lot, but it's unusual. And they're often spread out. And then you go and you look and you find the problem. So when that agar plate turned out, when you looked up in the ceiling, and this isn't the duct, it's an example of a ducting, there was a big tear in the side of the ducting. So what was happening is the clean air was coming in, but going through the, the ceiling space uh, and accessing through all the little holes and therefore taking all the dust. If you've ever been up in the ceiling space, and I've been up in lots, there's always gubbins up there, there's bits and pieces and leftover sweetie wrappers and loads. There's just stuff up there that you wouldn't believe. And that is just coming straight in, unfiltered, beautifully filtered air all the way to here. And we didn't notice until we found stuff on the plate. It's better, even better than an agar plate, is to find out by managing your engineering controls, measuring the pressures, checking the duct system, you know, if there's a drop-off in pressure. Um, and then... The, another, the, another situation that I found in an, in an HD where we had an increase in Lyme infections, had a look up in the ceiling, and there, there was no duct. So it'd come up to the space above the ceiling. And then there's a gap, so it's just pushing air in, and then there's no duct to the actual supply grill. Again, it was just filling up that space, and you can actually see long, dripping bits of dust on long, skiddly bits all the way down. And that had been a refurbishment not that long ago either. So then you come to the point of, so you've come from outside, if you've got nice clean air, it goes through all the ducts and they're beautiful and everything's grand. And it comes to the point of supply. Now this is a chilled beam. Now in the context of what we're talking about today, um, carbon emissions, reducing energy, this has been put in place across the globe as a good solution because it uses less energy because the air is chilled and heated at the point of supply. So you don't lose all the heat as it comes through the ducting grand idea. But see if you're innovating ideas about energy conservation. Please do not ignore infection risk. We can't have a situation where you can either have infections with lots of energy problems or reduce energy but take with it infections. That's not innovation. That's replacing one bad thing with another bad thing. So this chilled beam, the reason I'm not very into chilled bins is that our experience with them is that they just collect lots of dust. This is me just putting my finger along it and just huge amounts of lint. So what happens is, is the air comes in, it entrains through the room, mixes up, picks up all the gubbins in the air, and air is soup. One of my friends, a colleague from Ireland, um, Orla Haggerty, describes it as air is soup. And in some places, it's a very thick soup. You just can't see it. And all the bits collect up here. This is not a filter. It's not replaceable. It's collecting on the fins. And you can imagine if this is straight above a cystic fibrosis patient, if it's above a hematology patient, it's collecting up skin squames. It's a beautiful nutrient facility for any. And if there's a bit of humidity and, oh dear, there's also a water supply because it needs water to chill and heat the air. It drips. And then you get air dripping through and you get dark, yucky uh, water dripping down into a clinical space. So um, we've actually published from the QUH on chilled beams and their, their issues. I'm sure there's solutions, but we need those solutions before they're in place in a, in a vulnerable environment. 
So here's some examples, some more examples of uh, a Burkholderia outbreak when there was pooled water, and this was in Norway, where they usually have a really great track record. Remember, they're great at MRSA and all the rest of it. But they had an early thaw, and the wa lots of water got into a ducting and got contaminated with Burkholderia contaminants. Six cases of endophthalmitis. Now, endophthalmitis, it's one of those things that you fear. I mean, I'm not squeamish, but see eye infections that destroy, you have to get your eye taken out. That is a serious consequence of having ducting that's contaminated. MRSA, this is an outbreak in an orthopedic ward, and it was the supply grills got contaminated because when they shut down the to save energy, so you can shut down the supply, you get some backdraft, and it takes all the MRSA that's in the room, gets up there, can colonize and then become part of the flora in the environment. Um, I'm just going to move on to uh, the idea of positive pressure, knowing that um, pressure differentials are important. So if you're trying to protect your patient, you want all the air to be clean and moving out of the space, taking everything out. Don't let anything bad come in. Negative pressure is the reverse. You're infectious, you're producing oodles of infectious particles. You want to keep that in and take it out. You don't want it to go into the corridors and elsewhere. This is the table, the magic table, Appendix 2 of SHTM. And it tells you exactly, and there's good reasons for these standards. They're not just made up, and they've been there for a long time. Positive pressure only for clean rooms, neutropenic rooms, and critical care. Everywhere else is basically negative or zero. You don't want positive pressure in your normal wards. You don't want things to be coming out of infectious patients into the rest of the unit. And also all these, um, notice that the ACHs do not drop below six, and there's good reasons for that. Now, this is a, a, a new room that told me it was positive pressure. It declared itself as a positive pressure room, except when I got one of those smoke um, producers like Frank showed, it goes straight in. Now, I had somebody telling me this is positively pressure because the air is positively going into it. Well, that's the problem, whoops, <laughs> is that air, air, positive pressure is always dependent on which way you're measuring from. So when we say a positive pressure room, we mean the air has to come out of it because you're protecting the patient. Well, the air is going in. Something's wrong. Doesn't matter what the validation says. And that's where this, this toilet paper comes in handy. This is the reverse. This is allegedly a negative pressure room put the toilet paper there, and it comes blowing out. I couldn't get the video to work, but, but that's what happens is it gets blown out. That is not a negative pressure room. And in fact, this is an old standard. In our, in our CL3 laboratory, we have, for biosafety, we have cabinets to make sure that the air is taking anything away. We need a visible display of where the air is going, because over the centuries, we've realized that, measure, that uh, di discs and dials and the best laid plans of mice and men can go wrong. And what you need is something visible telling you which way the air is going. In order to maintain positive pressure or negative pressure, you need a well-sealed room. It's not going to work if you've got gaps, like this is a hole in a window, hole in the ceiling space, holes around, bits coming into the room. This is a, called a positive pressure ventilated lobbied room, and it's supposed to be sitting at 10 pascals because it's a different design. It has a lobby, and the air goes from the lobby into the corridor or into the room and should be taken out. A lot of hospitals have put these in place because they're supposed to do a bit of both, a bit of protection, a bit of... But they're not actually approved for either very immunocompromised or very infectious patients. And the reason um, I don't particularly like them is that we've seen a lot of issues with them. And some, this was one day I just walked past and it was plus 20. There's no alarm system on it, for one thing. And then, this is because the extract failed. A damper came down due to a fire alarm and didn't open it back up. So all the air is pouring out. So you could say, OK, fine, no airs come from the patient inside to outside. But see, you're a staff member and you walk in. That air in the bedroom has not been changed for who knows how long. So now you've got very potentially concentrated area of pathogen in the air. So does it matter? Yes, of course it matters. The reason we have them is that we've got experience of when it goes wrong. Varicella outbreaks, nasty TB, very resistant TB outbreak in Spain, uh, a very important paper in HIV patients, 47 deaths. Because the ventilation, oh, there was no ventilation. There was no negative pressure. 
There's no six, not even six A's each. It matters. Um, I've got just a couple minutes, so I'll go through um, theatres and explaining that it's not just about your plan. So this is a great plan, the, the cascade of errors from clean to dirty. We all know that. The cleanest, cleanest part is the prep room. It goes out through the operating room and then out. However, your people have to understand that that's the cascade and you don't really want them to think of the prep room as a place to keep your sangers and to sit and do your work and to have a wee gossip because actually you're not using it as a prep room. You're doing all the prep layup in the theater but you've forgotten that the air is going from here to there. I had to take a bubble machine into theatres to show that the air is going that way, not that way. And then you have to change the, the habits. This was a theatre suite that had doors opening and closing constantly because they were automatic and they were set incorrectly. And there were no um, automatic closers um, on the doors when there should have been. Another theatre suite, an older one, I counted 20 baffles that were missing or stuck. What's a baffle? Who cares about a baffle? The pressure, it helps decide where the air goes when it should go. I found them on top of a fridge. It was Malcolm Thomas said to me, if you were given a car, and it doesn't matter if it's an old one or a new one, and you can have one without one wheel, is that going to do you any good? No, it's not. A ventilation system is a system. It's the component parts working together. And so we have to give the same importance to every aspect of it. And we don't just say, well, at least the air handling unit's passed its validation, but you've got all the baffles sitting on, on a fridge. Does it matter? Yes, it matters. Theatres, outbreaks, very well established in the literature. Here's one in an ITU. Here's the air coming through. And you can see it's coming over this ceiling tile that's falling down. Lots of dust in there. Air movement. Think about what the air is doing. It's in training along here because it's coming from the diffuser, picking up stuff into an ITU setting. Am I being fussy? Or is this science? This is science. This is saying that you're increasing the probability of an infection, a potentially catastrophic infection. You're increasing the probability by not paying attention to clean air. Does ACH matter? Yes, it does. There's some really nice papers that show that uh, reducing the, uh, sorry, increasing the volume of a room and increasing the ACHs will, incre will reduce the risks of transmission. And ACH is not just about the time after you move out of a room. So we've all got used to that with COVID. We're saying, is it two hours? Is it one hour before we can clean because of the ACHs? And suddenly everybody's interested in ACHs. That's important, but actually it's not the fundamental point. The point is that if you have six ACHs and you have somebody coughing, 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 they're not stopping, they're releasing. There's a continuous release within the space. It's not from outside, it's within the space. You will drastically reduce the time to steady state, but your steady state will be so much lower. So with three, it's going up and carrying to going up. With six, so does it matter three and six? Yes, it matters. And also, if you're going to put energy in, changing it from two to three and three to four is much, much more important than going from 12 to 15 because your bang for your buck is at the beginning of the exponential. Final point, I'm sorry, I'm eating a couple minutes into Yvonne's time, um, is mixing. The air comes in beautifully clean. It's meant to go round, mix, take out the gubbins and go out through the toilet. What happens if you place an extract in the wrong place right next to the supply? Well, you get super, super clean air at the top, but nobody's up there and the rest of it is not being ventilated at all. Um, and this illustrates that beautifully is that it's not just ACHs. So you can have, this is poor ventilation, there's no difference in how effective this is for a person standing above an infectious patient if you've got a poor design. Whereas if you've got a good design, the ACHs matter. So again, ACH mixing work together. Don't just look at one aspect of it. And that's... I'm going to skip over that. Um, just a wee thing about uh, HEI scribes, which if you're an infection control or estates, you will know that that is a risk assessment tool. Please, when you say hazard and you're talking about dust, don't say dust. The hazard we're really talking about from an infection control point of view is pathogens. So the bacilli or fungi in this setting. If you're knocking down walls in hospitals 
And if it's negative pressure, tick. We need negative pressure, tick, on the piece of paper. And you walk past and you've got this. That's no negative pressure. The HAI scribe is not a piece of paper. The HAI scribe is a risk mitigation tool that matters on the ground. So they did this in 1741. They did a trial of pushing masses of clean air into ships that were, had what they called distemper. This is pre-germ theory. And they made a huge difference to the Swedish fleet in number of people who died at sea. And they managed to innovate big machines that pushed clean air, purging was the word they used, purging the filthy spaces of all that was, they thought was toxic or miasma, we now know would be pathogens in the air. If they could do that back then, we can do it now. And will we stay with the status quo? We need, a, we need a whirlwind. We need a typhoon of fresh air through our culture within the NHS. We can't accept 55% of hospitals don't meet standards. That's on paper. I guarantee you the other 45% aren't meeting it either in some places at least. So what's our culture? And if we find a problem, it needs fixed. So thank you very much for your time and thank you for my invite.